Okay, hello everybody. This is going to be a runtime analysis uh, practice video. I'm going to be giving you some problems to try out and then I'm going to be walking through the solutions. Okay, give a tight runtime bound for the best, worst, and overall case. Go ahead and pause the video and try it out. And I will go over it now. So whenever I see a for loop, there are two things that I ask myself. Number one, how many iterations will there be And secondly, how much work is done during each iteration? So let's see if we can answer um, these questions for the code that we're provided. I have two for loops. And for the first one, I see that I start at zero and I increment by one until I get to n. So I'm going to be doing n iterations. And similarly, down here, I'm going to be doing m iterations. Now, how much work is done during each iteration? Well, to find that out, I need to look inside the for loop and see what's going on. And I find that I'm simply doing a calculation. I'm just adding something to A. So this is going to be constant runtime. OK, so now we can begin to assemble our, um, our bounds. When I get input into F1, it first um, has to pass through this for loop, and then it has to pass through the second for loop over here. There's really no um, input that I could give that would uh, speed this up or turn this into some sort of best case or, or worst case um, in the sense of like, you know, slower and faster runtime, right? Now you might be tempted to say something like, oh, well, what if n was zero? Then I wouldn't even have to do this for loop. But remember, that's um, that's a trap that you can fall into, and you don't want to fall into that trap because why is that incorrect? That's incorrect thinking because asymptotic analysis assumes large input size. Okay. So what can I say about my runtime? Well, first, I'm going to come into this uh, first for loop, and I'm going to perform an action that takes constant time n times. So n times 1, that's going to be n. Then I'm going to go down to my next for loop, and I'm going to perform something that takes constant time m times. So m times 1 is m. And I have to do both of these things. So my runtime for the best, worst, and overall case is going to be theta of n plus m. OK, give a tight runtime bound for the best, worst, and overall case. Assume that kernel takes constant time. Go ahead and pause the video and try it out. And now I'm going to go over it. OK, so what is the best case? Well, the best case is when I hit the break statement every single time so that I never have to go through this second nested for loop. OK, so in other words, the best case is when kernel is always true. OK, so if kernel is always true, then that means that any time I go into my for loop, I'm going to immediately break. And this whole entire um, 
inside is just going to um, run in constant time. Okay. Now, how many iterations are going on with my outer for loop? Well, there's going to be n, n iterations. Okay. So I'm doing something that takes constant time n times. That means that my best case is going to be theta of n. Now, how about the worst case? Well, the worst case is going to be, you know, exactly the opposite situation. When kernel is always false, and I never get to uh, break out of my inner for loop early. Okay, I never hit that break statement, and I'm forced to go all the way through this second for loop in addition to the first for loop. Okay, so let's look and see what's going to happen um, in that case. Okay, and to do this, I'm actually going to um, uh, draw a little table out here. I'm going to start by keeping track of i. So we know that i goes from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, all the way up until n. I guess we can say n minus 1. Um, now, for each of these i values, how many iterations are going to occur um, within my inner for loop? Because we can note, we notice right here that it is going to depend on the value of i, right? So the number of iterations for the inner for loop is not going to be constant, okay? It's going to change as i changes. So when i is equal to 0, I initialize um, j to n, and I check and see if j is larger than i, and then I decrement, okay? And I keep decrementing until j is no longer larger than i. So how many iterations is that going to take? Well, that's going to take n iterations. And then in the case where i is equal to 1, that's going to take n minus 1 iterations. And then n minus 2, n minus 3, and then this is going to be 1. Now, how much work am I doing each time that I iterate through this inner for loop? Well, this right here, this is uh, this takes constant time, right? They told us in the problem, assume kernel takes constant time, right? So checking to see if kernel of j is true or not is going to only take constant time, right? So that means that if I'm doing um, n iterations, I'm performing an operation that takes constant time n times, and the work is going to be n. Similarly, the work here is going to be n minus 1, and here it's going to be n minus 2, and there we go, okay? So now we can sum up all of this work, and we can find our total runtime, okay? Because right here, what does this represent? Well, this represents the traversal through this entire code for the first iteration of the outer for loop, right? And then this is the second iteration of the outer for loop. And then we're going to keep uh, uh, doing, I know how much work is being done for each iteration of the outer for loop, right? And it's it's not constant, it is variable, but that's okay, right? So first we do n, and then we do n minus one, and then we do n minus two, and we keep doing this up until we reach one. Now, what type of sum is this? Well, this is an arithmetic sum, right? And this is one of those sums that when we see it, in the context of asymptotics, we immediately have to think theta of n squared. Okay, so the worst case runtime is going to be theta of n squared. Now, how about our overall case? Well, recall that we can take advantage of the fact that we found the best case and the worst case to provide a um, tight bound for the overall case, okay? So our tightest 
our tightest omega bound is going to be omega of n, right? Because omega of because uh, theta of n was the best case, and our worst case, I'm sorry, our um, tightest big O bound is going to be um, uh, big O of n squared. Okay. Okay, give a tight runtime bound for the best, worst, and overall case. Okay, so let's go over it, okay? So we have um, a nested for loop going on, and I'm noticing that the number of iterations that the inner for loop does will um, depend on the value of i. OK, so let's just start by thinking about how many iterations the outer for loop is going to do. Well, I'm starting with i is equal to n. And as long as i is larger than 0, I'm dividing by 2. OK, so whenever I see this, I start thinking about those problems that have recursion in them where I have to draw out these types of trees, right? That look like this. And eventually they get to um, these little leaves that have input size one. And we can re refresh our memory really quickly that the height of this tree is log of n, right? So the number of times that I had to divide n by 2 in order to get to input size 1 was log of n. What about for the inner for loop? Well, with the inner for loop, I'm starting by setting j equal to 0, and then I'm incrementing j, and I'm continuing to iterate through this for loop as long as j is less than i. Okay, so let's make a table like we made last time. What i is going to start off at n, sorry, it looks kind of messy. Okay, i is going to start off at n, and then i is going to become n over 2, and then it will become n over 4, and eventually it's going to be down to 1, okay? So that means that n iterations are going to be done when i is equal to n, and then n over 2, and then n over 4, and then 1. Now, how much work is done inside of my inner for loop? Well, I'm just doing a simple calculation, right? I'm just taking b and multiplying it by itself. So what's the runtime on that? Well, that's constant, right? So if I have n iterations and I'm doing something that takes constant time, n times, that means that my work is n. And then similarly, this will be n over 2 work, n over 4. And then this will be 1 work. So now we have come up with a way to express the work that is done for um, each iteration through the outer for loop right? This is the very first iteration when i is equal to n. This is the second one when i is equal to n over 2. And then we finally make our way down to the situation where i is equal to 1. So how am I going to figure out the total work that's being done? Well, I just need to sum up the work um, that's done during each iteration of the outer for loop. And what type of sum is this? Well, this is another one that we should um, recognize, right? This is a geometric sum. And when we see a geometric sum and we're doing asymptotic analysis, we should be thinking to ourselves, oh, well, that's theta of n, OK? So um, theta of n is going to be the runtime in the best case 
in the worst case and in the overall case, because there's no input that I could give um, into this function that would uh, make, make it faster, right? N is always gonna be big and this is always gonna be our runtime. Okay, let's do this um, problem from midterm two, spring 2016, that asymptotics problem that you knew was coming. Okay, so we are asked to give the runtime in theta notation as a function of n. All right, go ahead and pause the video and try this out, and then I'll go over the answer. Okay, so let's start by looking at our outer for loop and the number of iterations that are going to be done for our outer for loop going to be n. And how many iterations are we going to do for our inner for loop? Well, since we're incrementing j by 2 this time, we're going to only have to do n over 2 iterations. Okay. And um, how much work is um, going to be done for each iteration of this inner for loop? Well, printing something out is constant time, right? So for each iteration of the inner for loop, I'm gonna just have something that executes within constant time. Now, I guess I'll just to be thorough, draw out um, the um, kind of table that we were doing earlier. Um, so what's I gonna start off as? It's gonna be zero and then one and then two, and then finally it'll be N. And how many, how many iterations is the inner for loop going to do when i is equal to zero? Well, look in here. There's the, the inner for loop. It, the number of iterations it, it does does not depend on the value of i, right? So it's always going to do n over 2 iterations. And... And how much work is going to be done if I iterate through the inner for loop n over two times? Well, if I do something that takes constant time n over two times, that's just n over two times one. And I'm ending up with this uh, table here, okay? So now we can realize that all I have to do is um, sum up this column, right? Sum up the work. And I could write it all out, but I don't have to. I can just realize that it's the same thing as saying n over 2 times n. And that's going to be equal to n squared over 2. And for the purposes of um, runtime analysis, we know that we don't want um, unnecessary leading constants or anything like that. So I can get rid of that um, kind of one half, one half in front of the n squared. And I can say my final answer will be theta of n squared. OK, go ahead and try this problem. And now I will go over it. So we can look at our outer for loop and we can quickly see that the number of iterations will be n. Now, how about for the inner for loop? Well, for the inner for loop, we're starting off with j is equal to zero and we're multiplying it by two until it gets to n. So how many times am I going to have to multiply j by 2 in order for it to be n? Well, this is going to iterate log of n times. OK, now how about this thing that's going on inside of the inner for loop? Printing out high, that's just going to take constant time, OK? So that means that this whole entire inside of the outer for loop is going to run in theta 
log of n, okay? So now I, I can kind of, it, it sometimes could be helpful to almost rewrite things, you know, once you do some simplification um, and you figure out what the inner runtime is, you can really just rewrite it like, you know, rewrite the situation like this, right? So I'm performing some uh, operation that takes me log of n time, n times. So that's going to give me a runtime of theta. Sorry, I can't write it all, I guess. That's going to give me a runtime of theta of n log n. Okay? So see, when you're doing these problems, you really just want to start looking at the code and just breaking it down bit by bit, right? You know, how long is, is this piece taking, right? How many iterations will this do? How many iterations will this do? You know, it's it's honestly sometimes uh, in just an investigative process, right? When we're doing asymptotic analysis, we don't want to assume anything. We just kind of want to, you know, have an open mind and, and look at the function for what it is and uh, just, you know, investigate uh, its runtime, really. Okay, now we are faced with a recursive asymptotics problem. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and go ahead and give it a shot. And I'm gonna go over it. So I'm actually, sorry, I'm going to... I don't think we need the instructions and I would like more space. Okay, so let's do this one, all right? So I'm I'm faced with a function p3 that takes in an input n and it checks if n is less than or equal to one. And if it is, then it's, it's it returns. In all, all other cases, it makes two recursive calls to p3 on n over two, on input size n over two. Okay, so I like to draw out trees when I'm doing this and I put the input size in um, the nodes. Okay, so I start by calling p3 on input size n, and then I make two recursive calls to p3, sorry, on size n over two. I do really suck at drawing the trees though. And then each of those children are gonna make two recursive calls to P3 on size N over four. Okay, and this is gonna continue, right? This is gonna continue until, until what? Well, until we reach our base case, right? So what's our base case gonna look like in terms of this tree, whoops. Well, it's going to look like um, leaves that have input size one. Okay, so we keep we keep dividing and calling p three until we get a structure like this. Okay. So, okay. Well, that's great. We managed to draw it out. What next? Well, now we need to. Uh, Oh my goodness, you guys, I am so, uh, this is just unbelievable. This is just, why is this looking so bad? I'm sorry. All right, sorry, some technical difficulties. <sighs> Let's see if this will work. Oh, thank God, okay. Okay. Um, now we need to figure out how much um, work is being done for each level of the tree. So when I start here, when I just, when I feed an input size n, where's the work coming from? Well, the work is coming from this, this check, if n is less than or equal to one. 
how much time does it take me to check if n is less than or equal to one? Oh, well, that's constant time, right? It's just theta of one. And then I move on with my life, right? The function is moving on with its life. It's, it's making these other two recursive calls, okay? And same for them. You know, the only work that they're going to do is checking and seeing if their input is less than or equal to one. So they're both going to do, actually, I'm going to say it like this, sorry. Um, they're both going to do one work, okay? So in this level, this level will end up with a total of two work. And how about the next level? Well, it's a similar story, right? This, this one will do one and then one and then one and then one, and we'll end up with a total of four work. And this will continue all the way until we get to the very bottom of our tree where how many how many um how many leaves will there be well there will be n of them right and they're all going to do one work so okay now we have you know we can write out a sum at this point And then, well, let's just do one more um, level, okay? So this will end up growing. Okay, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so we're seeing what's going on here. This is a sum that we recognize as being theta of n. Okay, so our runtime for this. Uh, recursive piece of code will be theta of n. Okay, let's go ahead and try this problem. Go ahead and pause the video. And now I will go over it. So we're dealing with p4 that takes um, an integer n as its input, and then it immediately defines an integer m to be some value, okay, some value that does not um, depend on the input size. And then it proceeds through a for loop that will iterate m times and um, output hello. So we really have to stop and, you know, kind of think about what we're given here. Okay. I'm going to tell you just straight off the bat that the, um, the correct answer is theta of one. And the reason is, you know, this runtime, it's, it's, I could give any input, n could be anything, and there's never going to be any sort of change in the runtime, okay? So if I want to give the runtime as a function of n, this is how I do it, okay? Okay, go ahead and try this problem. And now I will go over it. So. We're given a function p5 that takes in an integer n as its input. And there's a nested for loop here. So let's let's just start by looking at the, the well, the inside. Okay. So the inside, the number of iterations done by this inner for loop are going to um, depend on uh, the value of i. Okay. So what values will I take on? Let's let's see. Well, we're going to start off with i equals 1. And then as long as i is less than n squared, we're going to multiply i by 2. OK, so this is. Um, kind of our progression of i values. Now, I'm um, sorry, I don't know. I should have just made the normal table. I don't know why I didn't put any sort of titles. Oh, now we're all messed up. It's OK. We're almost there. This is the last problem. OK, so this will be i, and then this will be number of iters for the inner for loop. Um, okay, so if i is equal to 1, then how many iterations are going to be done? Well, 
I mean, j is equal to zero, j is less than i. Okay, that's only going to make it through one iteration. Okay, what about if i is equal to two? Well, then that's going to make it through two. And then, okay, I guess it'll do four and then eight. And then, okay, so it's on a similar trajectory here, right? And um, how much work will be done if I do one iteration? Or if I do two iterations or four iterations, let's find the work that corresponds with this particular number of iterations. Um, well, I'm dealing with uh, something that has a constant runtime once again. Okay, so if I iterate once and I perform something with a constant runtime, then I do one work. If I iterate twice, then, uh, and then if I iterate four times, then I'm going to do four work and eight, and then, okay, you get it, right? It's up to n squared work if I'm iterating n squared times and doing something with a constant runtime. Now, I'm going to have to figure out the total work. And thanks to my, my table, I can easily jot down this summation. And if I can recognize it as arithmetic or geometric, then that would be great. And yeah, I mean, I think we both can recognize it as geometric, right? Because here I'm multiplying by two and then by two and by two. Okay, so remember, when we have a geometric sum, the way that we find out the runtime is we take theta of the last term. Okay, so, well, here's my sum, and what's my last term? My last term is n squared, okay? So that means that my runtime will be theta of n squared. Okay, just to refresh, um, just as a memory refresher, because it's always helpful, um, even though we've made it all the way through the worksheet already, um, can't hurt to remind ourselves. Um, for the arithmetic sum, you're going to do theta of the last term squared. Okay. So I guess now that I'm like thinking about all this, I guess a common trap might be to look at this down here, right? One, two, four, and then think to yourself, oh, 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 that's that's a geometric sum, right? And we are we are very used to seeing a geometric sum that that has n as its last term right we've this is very common this 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 comes up in a lot of problems but what you need to realize is that a geometric sum is totally allowed to end in something like n squared right it's it's a lot it's can end in n to the like anything it could end in something ridiculous like that and all you need to do is you just need to take theta of the last term, okay? So even if I had this at the very end, I would just have to go like this, okay? In 61b, that's what you need to remember, okay? Okay, I hope that this was helpful. Um, good luck on your midterm. <laughs>